morning we are very happy to welcome you for this uh, uh, second session of fourth day on behalf of our department and uh, from dr mgr education and research institute we just uh, showcase our happiness to you by having by going to listen your uh, uh, talk for another uh, one and a half hours um, by by in the, in the same time i would like to convey my sincere thanks to you by accepting our request to be the resource person for our fdp program Uh, thank you sir and with this uh, i just request my colleague dr vikto sudajaj to take over the session by introducing the guest speaker yes thank you thank you ma'am uh, dear participants now we are starting the next session it's about uh, nature inspired learning mechanisms by dr shiva shankar b nayar about sir Sir is currently working as professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Engineering, IIT Guwahati. Sir was the adjoint professor in the School of Electrical Science, IIT Bhubaneswar before, and earlier he was working in the Department of Applied Electronics in Amravati University okay, since 1986. Sir was the editorial board member in IETE Technical Review, Taylor's and Francis, and he has published more than sixty research papers in reputed journals. Sir was the chairman for Gate two thousand seven in IIT Guwahati, and one more thing is Sir is awarded with Korean Brain Pool Professorship. by the south korean federation of science and technology for research in emotional robotics the areas of interest are cyber physical system internet of things intelligent mobile agents nature inspired systems network and emotional robotics decentralized system nature inspired language processing intelligent immune system genetic algorithm fuzzy systems and federated learning sir we are very much honored to have in our session we are uh, very uh, what very much uh, happy to have you here sir now i request sir to take over the session Your mic is on mute. Can you unmute, sir? Sir, unmute, sir. Unmute your mic, sir. Please. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the introduction and also for inviting me for a talk. Thank and you, sir. It's a pleasure, to talk sir. To all of you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll just try and share the screen. Yes, sir. Please. I hope the screen is visible. Yeah, it's sir, getting it's yeah, it's visible, sir. Now you can uh, mute your video, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You can. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can proceed, sir. Okay. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. It's almost going to be afternoon, so a good afternoon to alongside. Uh, I hope my voice is loud and clear. 
Yes, sir. It's perfect, yes, sir. sir. You can yes, proceed, sir. So I uh, I am trying to. My basic intention is to inspire you into looking at nature rather than looking at these kind of technical books which we have been doing so for all these years. So sometimes it's always best to look into nature to find out better and possibly even easier solutions to complex problems. So this is what my intention is by, behind the, the main intention behind my lecture. So please be with me all through. There will be naturally a certain amount of nature, a certain amount of biology in the whole thing. And then how we connect this biology and nature to actual physical systems. So this is what the whole essence is about in this, uh, uh, in this topic and this lecture. So in the first case, first like uh, first uh, slide itself, you can see a, an elephant carrying the cub of a lion, lioness. All of them are going towards uh, the water hole where possibly there's water. And uh, the most important thing out here is that there is a predator as well as a prey. In the wild, generally the prey, prey and predators keep aloof. But uh, in this particular case, it seems that the prey is coming to the help of the predator. This is a very important thing even in, in a struggle for survival. It looks slightly different here because uh, this doesn't seem to be like struggle for survival. But the inner mechanisms tell us something else. The inner, inner state tells us possibly that, of course, we can't go into the brain of the elephant nor the brain of the lioness. But here it says very clearly that even the herbivorous uh, elephant seems to help the, uh, the child of the predator mainly because if the, if the predators die over a period of time, then the jungle will be full, filled with all herbivores and they'll eat up all the grass and then finally they will also eventually die. So nature keeps a very subtle sort of uh, control system. The control system is so adjusted so that there are, equal, uh, there are ample number of herbivores and there are ample number of predators to keep the uh, respective populations in place so that the whole jungle by itself or nature by itself is stabilized. The reason possibly why the, why the elephant is helping the lioness with by carrying the cub, which can't walk that much possibly, is because if it knows that if the next generation of the predator, namely the, the lion for it in this part in the in this particular case, the cub doesn't survive, then, they, then it is possible that the number of predators will go down. And if the number of predators go down, the number of herbivores will go up proportionately. And then naturally the jungle will be a difficult place to live. So they seem to be understanding each other and then helping each other in spite of the fact that they are basically prey and predator. So this is an important lesson that you take from the jungle, the way in which you balance a control system. Let's move on further. So this is something which I would like you to read. Uh, possibly I don't want to waste too much time on the slide, but more importantly, please don't expect me to share the slides. You, you need to write, have a paper and pencil in front of you and keep jotting if you're interested. And then maybe you can search the net or any, anywhere else in your library for more information about what I'm talking of. So what, the first thing that we go beyond before we go further is that of natural intelligence just a quick look at what is natural intelligence well i i mean i'm not able to define what intelligence means forget about natural but it it seems that when uh, you generally tend to say that a part particular person is intelligent because uh, he is more experienced in that particular field he knows more about that field of a particular domain which you are talking of. And then because you know lesser than that person, you think that that person is intelligent. But when he goes somewhere else, where he finds another expert in the same field, a better expert in the same field, he feels that that person is more intelligent than him. So intelligence is basically a relative feeling of what, feeling of what the other person has about a particular person. Based on that feeling, you tend to think either you're intelligent, more intelligent, or maybe you're less intelligent. And the things keep changing because the, when the domain of work or the domain, the focus changes from one domain to another, then the feeling of intelligence again changes because you may be intelligent in some sense in a particular domain, you may have expertise. So you are intelligent in that field, but it may not be so in some other field. So this is something which I just quickly wanted to talk about uh, intelligence. Now let's go further. One important factor that you need 
need to uh, you need to remember is that most of the time most of you are i'm i'm sure most of you are teachers just like me we are all teachers and we keep teaching things by studying something from some book and that possibly is, you know, that particular author of that book was possibly taught by some other or some other person and that person was taught by some other person and so on and so forth so this thing is the same thing is being taught again and again and dinned into us and so much so we become so biased with what is there in the book so there are times when you should look away from the book and think otherwise can the same sort problems be solved in a different way and maybe a better way and under such conditions nature seems to be providing more practical problems in such conditions so it is best to also look at nature apart from thinking by yourself it's also very important to look at nature and see whether the problem which you are trying to solve is somewhere in nature has some, nature has solved that problem in some means maybe in some other context and then try to find out how it has solved it try to extract that solution and then put put it into your kind of problem and solve it many a time you'll find that that may be a simpler way of doing uh, solving a very complex problem so this is something that one should encourage oneself to do and not only oneself of course the students who you teach to but then when you when you nature comes into picture then biology also comes into picture but that doesn't mean that you should just open a book on biology and read it that's not the way i'm talking out you should read biology from an engineering perspective a human body for instance is an engineered system it is though we call it biology it is a better engineering feat than any of the engineering things that we have done across the world so look at biology as an engineering from the engineering perspective and then try to interpret it in the right spirit and then take solutions from that this is what is the essence of what i'm trying to push into all of you so here are some some kind of uh, bio inspirations which i pushed up, put put up there are many things in nature you can look at these are only a few of them one on the left side top you can see a no, large number of ants which make a colony and that colony could possibly make a, make some things like as huge as ant hills as you can see on the right side below that's a huge ant hill that ant hill could be a, a, something like a, a, for instance it could be 20 meters tall you can imagine something which is 20 meters tall standing right maybe in a slender neck at the bottom even uh, as can be seen here even when the snow inside the snow is it, the ant hill is covered with snow the inside temperature still is maintained at 28 degrees it's a real engineering feat in fact and if if the ant hill is in the desert then you will still feel that the outside temperatures could be around 54 55 degrees and inside inside temperatures could be just around 32 34 degrees so they have already engineered the feat and they have already constructed it somebody somebody in africa i'm told has copied this kind of technology into actual uh, buildings and then found out that uh, it seems to be far more cooler inside now the point to be noted here is that we are not going into civil engineering aspects but we are looking at other aspects of how ants do all these things if you take one individual ant and see whether it can build the ant hill it's just not possible it is possible only by a collection of tiny ants and together they make such a kind of such a make such a kind of a phenomena possible and this is what they call as emergent intelligence Give, given small small beings with limited capabilities but in large numbers you can possibly have a, a new and emergent intelligence so the very fact that it can build this particular ant hill of this sort of this uh, these kind of features is itself intelligence but when you look at who has done it it's not one single ant but a uh, multiple multiples of multiples of ants it could be like something like 250000 ants forming a colony that can build such a thing the other important aspect which you need to consider here is that these ants do not talk to each other directly they communicate by different ways and they do not have a loudspeaker and they don't keep announcing themselves that now i'm going to do this and now now you better do this so there is no central authority in the whole thing the whole system is what what we could technically call as decentralized so everybody is a, a peer and everybody contributes to the building of whatever they are doing either be it foraging of food be it making a, a path towards the food source or maybe building an ant hill so in all these cases the the system is decentralized each one does 
it's his own, his, uh, the ant by itself, the ant as an entity, a single entity, tries to do things by itself and communicates with the others which are in the neighboring area. Most of you may also have noted or known that ants, when they move around, they lay what are called as pheromone trails. Pheromones are basically volatile chemicals that are secreted by some, uh, some glands within the ant, and then they lay that as they move around. And as they move around, this particular pheromone is sensed by other ants and they, those ants start following it. But do remember that the pheromone by itself contains more information than just a trail. It could be like, for instance, it could tell the other ant who's following that there is so much, I mean, the amount of food, food there is at a particular place, the, the, whether there is a predator there, whether there's danger there, all those things are written onto this small information which is put in as the ant moves so that the others may as well follow it or not follow it depending upon the information written on it. So ants use what is called as a, an indirect way of communication apart from other direct ways. The more important part is they play a very important role in indirectly changing the environment and thereby communicating with the other. What, do, what I mean by indirectly communicating is that they change the environment by laying the pheromone and the pheromone is the one that is being sensed by other ants. So naturally when, you, when one ant lays a pheromone, there are multiple ants who are trying to sense what is written in the pheromone. And by virtue of that, they communicate from one to many. So this is what they call as a, an indirect means of communication and it reduces a lot of bandwidth problems. In our kind of world, in the computational world, if you use the same kind of method, then that will reduce a lot of bandwidth. Pheromones are of course uh, volatile in nature. It doesn't mean that they keep on putting pheromones everywhere. So in that case, the whole world would be full of pheromones. That doesn't happen because they are volatile in nature and after a certain period of time, they, they, uh, they evaporate and go away. So the, the, the take home out here is that a large amount of, a large collection of small ants capable of doing small things together make a, make a big thing, like an anthill for instance. On the other side, you can see bees also. Bees are also to an extent decentralized in the sense that they, though there is, a, there is a queen bee inside, the queen bee doesn't really control the whole show. It only is for, for a certain amount of things like laying eggs and uh, sort of keeping the swarm together. Bees communicate with each other by, uh, by many ways. One of them, one of the most important and significant methods is what they call dancing. So when a new beehive is being is needed to be made, then the, the uh, bees, they make gr groups of themselves and they move around in an area, in each group going in different directions. They survey the place, try to find out which is the best place they can find to, to make the hive. Then they come back. And when they come back, they discuss with each other by, by dancing. By performing different dances, they communicate to the other groups as to how the, uh, the, the uh, what is the goodness of a particular place, how, whether this place is good, it is safe, how much of food is there, all these things are communicated by dances, and then they come to a mutual consensus and then uh, elect a particular, a particular place to be uh, the place where the new hive has to be built. So here also you can see a certain amount of decentralization and then how they come together, how they communicate with each other, all these things can be taken up as goodies from the nature, from nature, and then you can use it in the physical world. So we are we are talking of cyber physical systems where we can actually use these kind of things. We'll talk of it as as we go to subsequent slides. On the on the other sides, you can see a, a genetic code, genetic algorithms, or also some other things that have been used which I'm sure most of you have at least heard of. I mean, some of you may have used it also. Those are also inspirations from nature. There are other th things like, for instance, movement of, uh, movement of a, a bird in, in a, a, a large flock of birds moving around in the air, or maybe locusts moving around. It could be even shoals of fish moving in the sea. They all group together and move, and then uh, do remember that they do not collide with each other. Possibly none of you must have seen two birds colliding in midair and then falling down. This is a very rare incident. If at all it has happened, I'm not sure whether it ever has happened to. So they, they do seem to keep a very good, very good distance from the other by using some kind of simple rules, 
fish also do the same thing when they are moving in shoals and when the in large shoals of millions of fish moving around and when the shark comes to they they bifurcate and then they again re reunite so as to avoid any of these kind of predatory attacks it is uh, it is uh, known that these fish for instance take take into consideration only very simple rules so simple rules are something like this uh, by the way am i am i audible to all of you yes sir yes okay. sir so Pretty do tell me in case it's not so yes sir yes sir sure sir so here sir here are a few rules which are very simple in nature which fish follow for instance if the fish is too close to another fish then it moves away so that it doesn't collide so it maintains a certain distance between its neighboring fish so that's what they call as negative feedback if there's some fish which is at an intermediate distance then it aligns itself to that like you look forward and say oh that that particular fish is going to the right side by 10 degrees then you also align it according i mean the, this fish also aligns to that if there's another fish at a greater distance still farther away and it's moving towards toward then it starts moving toward that's it of course if the fish is not seeing any other fish then it has to do any some random search because it's obvious that it has lost lost itself from the crowd it disconnected it from the crowd so it has to do a random search but by using this three or four simple rules the fish follow a fish ensure that they are in the swamp they are in the shoal they are have a distance maintained from the others and then most importantly they don't do not collide do remember that when we as human beings who are who walk around in the uh, in a 2d plane we seem to be not we seem to be always uh, hitting each other if you're going to a busy market you will definitely see that your shoulders your elbow hit somebody or your hands hit somebody or your legs possibly step on somebody else's legs so these things seem to happen in fact in in what way i wonder how why we call ourselves so intelligent whereas these fish these birds for instance do not collide with each other even when they are in a 3d plane then there are other things that possibly we might if time permits we'll discuss that uh, is the immune system i'll shelve it for a moment so what you see on the left side bottom is uh, the immune immune system wherein those kind of immune cells the white blood corpuscles are attacking a particular a particular being that is a cell which is attacking the body let me go to the next slide so what does nature have to offer us possibly better and simpler solutions this is very important but these simpler solutions come at a small cost because these are all population based algorithms what you do in your computers are generally like you do you take one one particular equation and try to solve it with different me different means and it is not it, it is not a concurrent process as in case of a population based process where in a population is several entities and they are all inside an environment and they all concurrently do some kind of things like we are all we all live in this earth which is our environment and then we all work towards it and then whoever is the best survives and otherwise the others are removed so it is basically population based so emulating them in in your computing systems maybe slightly difficult but we'll look at how we can do it then most of the systems most of what what you see in nature are distributed in nature they are decentralized more specifically why do we all why do, am i always saying de decentralized is that when you have a centralized system like for instance a central server connecting to connected to so many clients so the clients request the server the server services the request and brings it back the point in a centralized system is that once the by chance if the central server goes down or it fails then the whole system goes down on the contrary if it's a decentralized system each one is by itself autonomous so there's no question about any failure and even if there is a failure it's the in, in, individual's failure rather than the complete system but that doesn't mean that we should not look at centralized systems too but we need to have a, a proper hybrid a, a proper we need to take a uh, take the pluses and minuses of both centralized systems and decentralized systems and of course distribute it too then nature uses what are called as local approaches as as we just said about pheromones so using pheromones uh, they it uses some kind of an indirect 
communication between not all insects use pheromones they use some other methods to the insects animals they use some other methods which is called a stigmergy by changing the environment you communicate to the others so that is what they call stigmergy so pheromone pheromoning is a type of stigmergic communication then there are uh, other things like autonomous behavior self adaptation self healing altruism social awareness emotions embodied intelligence embodied intelligence in the sense that there is a the physical the actual intelligence is inside a body and the body is actually physically moving in an environment and it, then it exhibits intelligence so if you embed some kind of intelligence into a robot then that becomes the body of that intelligence and then that's what we call as embodied intelligence and then if it's placed in an environment it learns from the environment and then it interacts with the environment in a, a better and better way over time naturally it, it has to it has to learn then for that it requires adaptation because if uh, if the environment changes it has to adapt so self adaptation is again an important thing autonomy of course is required to an extent because the because a physical system needs to do things by itself rather than always try to talk to a superior to find out what is to be done so autonomy is an important issue then self healing is also another thing one part of something if it fails then you need to again regenerate that for instance if uh, you are hurt at some point maybe the blood, the blood comes up uh, if you if, if there is a pin prick then naturally from the pin prick the blood flows out it coagulates and seals that thing off after a certain after a certain period of time when the skin grows then that particular coagulated portion of the uh, of the Uh, of the blood goes off so this is self healing in nature in actual physical systems too we do have self healing like a, 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 a small system a computer in a node if it all by chance has some issue then it possibly goes for a reboot and then comes back again after maybe trying to uh, reset things and then again coming back to the system so that could also be looked at as self healing emotions are also an important thing because emotions uh, in fact uh, emotions are extremely uh, effective in in the natural world because if you don't have emotions there are many other issues like for instance if you do not have fear if you don't have fear then you would possibly be moving around in the jungles maybe swimming across in an ocean full of sharks because you're not afraid of anything and in the process you might possibly get killed and so so it naturally means that emotions are required for for this struggle for survival uh last before i change the uh, slide i would like to point what has been written down there about 100 million cells in your body have already died by the time i read the statement so one important part in your system is, is that some many of the cells or million cells more than a million cells are dying as we talk uh, across this uh, across this internet and uh, as you sit there and listen to what i'm saying and a new new set of that many million cells have occupied the place of the older cells so now you can imagine that when you were young what were you and what you are right now in about a few months time you will possibly have replaced all your cells in the body but the you within is the same you have not changed but your body has changed so many so many times over the years so what does uh, how do what all paradigms have they taken out from nature for in, one of them is the artificial immune systems which we'll just discuss there are evolutionary systems like for instance genetic algorithms genetic programming which many of you are aware of possibly then there are swarm intelligence like for instance we just we just had a quick look at those rules which are basically swarm rules and then there is intelligence across to many other intelligent algorithms have been developed which are pertaining to swarms self healing artificial life amorphous computing which are basically computing using small processors small constant constrained processors then of course many of you do know about um, artificial neural networks which is the hot thing right now with deep learning coming up with so many gpus trying to crunch a lot of data and then finding out rules with it so these are all paradigms which people have taken from nature so let's look at one of the paradigms because uh, this whole uh, this whole course seems to be uh, moving across or rather focused uh, focused on security i thought it best to uh, have a quick look at the artificial immune system why did why did i look at the immune system because the immune system 
system by itself is something that is uh, uh, protecting your body. The natural immune system protects your body. As you sit and hear what I'm saying, there's a big war going on on your body between viruses and uh, all sorts of the viruses, then bacteria and whatnot. They, all of them are attacking your body and your body is constantly defending it. You are not possibly... Hello, sir. Your voice is not audible. Hello. Sir, your voice is not audible. Sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. There is no voice. Ma'am, due to network issue, I think uh, okay, Sar is okay. left. He will okay, be rejoining. Okay, then we'll wait. Yeah, we'll wait. Here, yes. participant, please be patient. Yes. Sar will be resuming as soon. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who yes, can hear you, sir? Yes, sir? Can you share your presentation, sir? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it went out. Uh, due to network issue, it might be happened, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm coming back. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can proceed now, sir. Okay, thank you. So one of them is mobility. Mobility in the sense that the 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 immune cells within our body they circulate across your system, constantly monitoring if there is any attack. So mobility is a very important issue, even in a physical system, a computer network. For instance, there are so many computers, so you need to have a physical system that well, a system that actually moves from one computer to the other to find out whether there is has been an attack. Then there are chemical and physical actions. As you can see on the right side, uh, there's a small uh, montage of uh, T cells, which are basically what they call as commonly known as so white blood corpuscles attacking a large cancer cell. And th th actually, there's a physical and biophysical activity between these two cells, the, the WBC cell, which is slightly white in color, and the other, which is red in color. So there is a chemical component. There's also a physical component. In it. There's also anomaly detection, which means you are trying to find out whether the other member whom you possibly think is, a, is an attacker or, an in, or your, your own self, like when you are, when you are in the imagine you are the soldier, you need to identify who are your fellow soldiers and who, who is the enemy soldier. So this kind of recognition system is also there within the, within the immune system. There's also a certain amount of tolerance. And tolerance in the sense that some of the, some of the so-called aliens who are not supposed to be there, who are not like you, can also sit in your body. For instance, in your gut or the stomach lining, you'll find a lot of bacteria which help you in digestion. So without that, you might possibly not live. So that, that is a must inside your body. So the immune system understands that, oh, these people are actually helpers rather than invaders. So it does not harm those, those, those kind of bacteria. So there are harmful bacteria. There are uh, uh, the, those bacteria which actually help you out. So they are, there's a certain amount of tolerance to to, uh, there is the immune system shows a certain amount of tolerance to such kind of uh, invaders. Then there is the robustness, there's feature extraction because it needs to understand whether this is a good bacteria or a bad bacteria. So in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of the new deep learning neural networks, we always talk about feature extraction. Here also it extracts the features and learns whether to attack this person or not. If the feature corresponds to features of good bacteria or their own, or maybe another WBC cell, then in that case, it doesn't attack. But if the feature does not correspond to that, then it says, oh, this is a, an invader and then it tries to attack. So feature extraction and therefore recognition is done by the immune system. There's diversity also. It is not that it can it can it is capable of attacking only one type of virus or one type of bacteria, but it's capable of handling a, a universe of bacteria and a universe of any such kind of invaders in, invading or attacking your body. There's also a learning component in it because that is generally done by 
reinforcement learning and then of course remembering remembering what has happened which is exactly what happens when you when you get a vaccination shot a weak virus is injected in you so that it stimulates a sort of attack into your system your system try your immune system tries to quell that a particular attack and in doing so it generates what are called as antibodies which are primed onto attacking and killing this type of virus so that process is a reinforcement learning process. And there's the, uh, so some of those cells which have learned to attack these kind, this particular virus which has been vaccinated into you, it, it tries to remember that so that in future, whenever that kind of virus attacks you, it will multiply and therefore ensure that the attack is not successful. It is distributed in nature, it's multi-layered, it is adaptive. All these features are there within the immune system. In fact, all the features which you would like to love to have in a physical system which you are making, a cyber physical system, is all there within the immune system and over and above, it protects itself. So it's like a cyber physical system with protection already in security, already, already embedded in it. So if you actually dissect the natural immune system and try to find out more study more, you'll find better methods of both how, how you can implement a cyber physical system and how you can implement a secure cyber physical system. So where, where all have these immune paradigms been used? One is fault, fault and anomaly detection, as we have already mentioned, if there is a fault or an attack or a fault in a particular system, which could be because of some kind of uh, breach, a security breach or some failure, those kind of things can be detected. It has been used in machine learning, pattern recognition, pattern recognition because you're actually trying to find out features. So basically underlying thing is pattern recognition, then agent-based systems, scheduling, autonomous control, optimization, robotics, language processing, and of course, security of information systems. I hope my voice is clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can proceed, sir. Okay. So have a, we, we just have a quick look at the biological aspect of the immune system. Remember that this is only a tip of the iceberg. Immune, immune system uh, by itself is a big thing. I'm only exposing a few slides and that too in a very fast manner. So as I just mentioned, it, it's a perpetual war that's happening in your body. The perpetual war is between the pathogen and the host. You are the host and you've got a number of cells within, within you and the pathogen is what the invader is. It is possibly a bacteria, virus or some, anything else of that matter, that, for that matter. So do remember that the pathogen by itself is not just a single person or single entity. It will come in uh, orders of magnitude, which is smaller than the host initially. So a small amount of bacteria, a small number of bacteria will enter your body. Once it enters your body, it, it gets all the nutrients which it requires. And based on that, it will multiply. And it, it can multiply to a very large number. So on your side, from your host side, that is your body side also, the, the immune cells are also capable of correspondingly increasing their numbers as and when required. So if there are more attacks by more number of the invaders or the pathogen, then these, these immune system cells also will multiply accordingly. And then it is a war between a big population of, anti, of antibodies and a big population of the entering, the invading pathogens. Then it's... Uh, based on the war, who wins will possibly tell us whether the host has survived or not. Okay. So the, the immune system by itself uh, is for protection of your of the host naturally. The, the more important part which I want to emphasize in this slide is that the, there are two things in your body, two uh, immune responses. Number one is the primary immune response, which is the innate immune response, also called as the innate immune response. So this is something like if you've got a common cold, for instance, your actual system doesn't kick off. You already have these antibodies available in you as some kind of a pre-written memory. So when you're born itself, you have this. And possibly this, this kind of antibodies possibly come through mother's milk, which is why we say that the, the child should have mother's milk as much as it can because that will that will give it a better primary immune response or an innate response. 
The other, so this is very generic, which will be same across all of us. For instance, common flu, common cold, all these things are covered by whatever you have in the body when you're born. But the other things like, for instance, chicken pox and all these are rarer things. So that, that naturally requires to requires you to actually be invaded by the chicken pox virus or possibly you, you've been vaccinated. Either way, you're being invaded. So for that, that uh, when it comes to something other than what the immune this primary immune system cannot respond to, then the secondary immune system is kicked in, kicks in. And that is adaptive in nature. Adaptive in the sense it learns how to attack. So by mutating itself, it tries to find out which is the best way to contain the incoming invader. And then it learns how to do it and it remembers from its past encounters. And this is what the secondary response, immune response is all about. So the, the, once it has learned, then whenever that same kind of virus or bacteria attack again somewhere down the, down the line, then the response is faster and possibly many a time you do not even know that you had, though you, since you already have had a chicken pox vaccination, you would never feel when chicken pox virus actually attacks you because the system has already learned how to cope up with the invasion. Okay. So here's, uh, here's how it looks like. As I said, the whole in, in, the immune system is layered in nature, and that's what the figure here shows, that the antigens or the pathogens, antigens, pathogens, these are all invaders. So they could be of different types. They could possibly, they will invade you initially at the skin level, which you can see is a blue line. And so once it, some of them may be, may be stopped by the skin itself because the pH of the skin, the sweat on the skin, the salt in the skin, the salinity will possibly destroy it. But some of them may possibly break the barrier, go through the skin and come into it. Then there are some biochemical barriers. For instance, the biochemical barrier could be uh, could be through the nose. There is mucus in your nose, the in your mouth when you when you secrete saliva. This it's alkaline in nature. So some set of antigens might possibly die during the process. So that's that's the second layer of second layer of defense. Then comes the innate, innate immune response, which I just mentioned, which uh, are handled by what what cells called phagocytes, which actually eat up the eat up the antigens or the invading pathogens. But if the phagocytes are also not capable of it, then comes the in, at the bottom you can see the adaptive immune response, which is which comprises B cells, T cells, and a range of such cells, all generally loosely called as lymphocytes. So point to be noted is that this particular immune system is layered in nature. So it has several layers of protection, first layer, second layer, third layer, like that. So let's have a quick look at how, a, how the secondary immune response works, the mechanism by which the T and B cells work. Just a quick look at it. I hope the animation is clear. I hope the animation is coming onto your respective screens. So here's the antigen. The antigen is generally uh, in a, in the, the, we are talking of the adaptive immune response, which is the secondary immune response, not the prior, in that one, which is common to all of us. For a specific antigen, an antigen presenting cell comes up and it tries to process that cell. It's more like pre-processing data. Data has come in, so it's pre-processing the data and then finding out whether this data is good or bad. So here the antigen is the data and the antigen presenting cell is the pre-processor. So the preprocessor actually breaks down the antigen and then presents a protein to a cell called as a T cell, which is the part of the immune system. The immune system T cell tries to find out whether this presented protein at the outer, outer periphery of the of the antigen, antigen presenting cell. It tries to find out whether it's a it's a good one or a bad one. So by, by little, if I can use the word, by tasting it, it finds out whether this piece of the antigen is actually an antigen or something else. If it is actually an antigen, then the T cell becomes what is called as an activated T cell. So it becomes, uh, it's like a warning bell comes up and therefore the T cell changes, my, it metamorphosizes itself into what is called as an activated T cell. And then the activated T cell releases what are called as lymphokines into your bloodstream. And those, those possibly actually go to and kill the antigen. So this is a mechanism by the T cell. There's still another cell called as a B cell, which is not, which doesn't require any pre-processing. The B cell can directly attack the antigen and kill it. 
So here's the antigen. Here's the B cell, which resembles the T cell to some extent. And then the T cell, the B cell actually finds out whether it's an antigen or not. If it detects an antigen, then it becomes what is called as an activated plasma cell. And the plasma cell is what releases the antibodies into the bloodstream. And it is this, these antibodies that go and plug the antigen and thereby neutralize it. I'm sure most of you uh, have gone to the doctor when you have fever and the doctor has prescribed maybe a, a blood test and then, then you try to find out whether the WBC count is high or low. And if it is high, it means that you have been, your body has been generating such kind of antibodies, which means there's an infection. So this is an indirect sort of way to find out whether there's an infection. Then of course the doctor gives you some antibiotics to help you out in destroying the antigen. So do remember that we are talking about security of your own system here. The, uh, the, when you look at the B cell, you can see that there are, there are some kind of, uh, uh, kind of Y-shaped things out here on top of the thing, which we have seen in the previous uh, slide too. These are called as paratopes. And these paratopes are actually flexible. They can mutate and it's more like you know your fingers. So you can actually move the fingers here and there. And then by mutation, they try to find out and try to feel the antigens. On the other side, we have the antigen. Antigen also has some kind of bumps. As we have seen in the, uh, in the montage above, the WBC and the uh, WBC cell, which is attacking the cancer cell on top, on the right-hand top, you can see that there are all flaps on each of those white WBC balls. So those flaps are basically what are the paratopes. And the paratope actually feels the bumps on the, on the antibody, antigen. So the bumps on the antigen are called as epitopes. Uh, can you all see my, uh, the mouse cursor, mouse yes, pointer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So th these paratopes basically are the paratopes here. Of course, they're very complex in nature. This diagram doesn't really represent it, but this is how it looks like actually. And by in a schematic representation, they look something of this sort. So these paratopes can actually move around and mutate and thereby change its shape. In right now, it looks like a Y shape, but it can possibly mutate and then find out whether the shape is a Y shape or some other kind of shape. So it's more like, you know, when you take uh, using your fingers, you um, when you take a pick up a glass and when you pick up a cup, your fingers move in different different ways. So this is also something in, in a similar way. So it learns by itself how to attack the antigen. An antigen, on the contrary, has different types of bumps. Here in the B cell, you will have if, if it is Y-shaped, all of them will be Y-shaped. There will be thousands of them across it, but all their shapes are same. Then this is one B cell, another B cell could may not have a Y shape, it may have a square shape, like for instance, this one, and that cell would have all square, squarish looking or rectangular looking par paratopes. Another one could have a U, U, U sort of shape on the paratope, and there could be millions of them across this particular cell. So all of them can feel different bumps here on the, on the antigen. These bumps are called epitopes. So if they feel the epitope properly, that means here, for instance, this is a bump which is uh, very nice and curved in nature, and this paratope is also there. So they are complementary in shape. And when the, com the complementarity matches, then this particular B cell is triggered and it opens up as a, becomes a plasma cell. It releases all, all antibodies whose shape is exactly this. And when it releases a lot of these kind of shapes, naturally these shapes move across your bloodstream and then finally plug this particular antigen wherever there's a shape like this. And in the process, they kill the antigen. So this is how the immune system works in a, in a very distributed and decentralized way. These, uh, these two immune cells don't talk to each other. There's no central server. They all act independently. So there are many theories which people have propounded regarding uh, immune systems. One is called as a clonal selection theory, in which, as we have just mentioned, that whenever there is a, whenever this particular antibody, this is the, the epitope of the antigen, 
only a small portion has been shown. If this complementarity is not correct, like as you can see that here, it's something like a something like a different shape here, the paratope and the epitope don't match each other. Then these kind of cells which have this kind of paratope are of no use because that doesn't seem to be very effective in controlling the antigen antigenic attack. So they are removed by, by the system, by the immune system automatically, by what they call is the negative selection. Here also you can see that this, this particular red square doesn't fit into this kind of a Y-shaped Y -shaped antibody, paratope. So again, once again, this also doesn't fit so that this kind of cells are also removed. There are many, many of these cells, in, in fact. So naturally, all these are removed because they are not effective in actually protecting you from these kind of antigens. But on the contrary, when you look at the next one here, you can see that this square one, for instance, seems to be fitting right here. If this is so, then the match is fine. This square thing goes right in and therefore it's able to really grasp it. So under such conditions, it is called positive selection. So this one gets more preference and this particular antibody with a squarish looking paratope that divides into many more, it clones itself and the clones again clone. So there is a sudden increase in rate of such kind of cells and these cells, some of them, they are kept as memory for future use. Some of them, transform themselves into what are called plasma cells. And these plasma cells will secrete, I will release a number of such kind of, such kind of paratopes, which are basically the antibodies. And these antibodies flow through the system and they will plug all these kind of square shaped antigens, wherever there's an ant antigen having a square shaped epitope, they plug it and then they'll kill it. And that's how the defense system works. These memory cells, on the contrary, they live for a long time. These are, of course, consumed over a period of time when the antigenic attack is over. These will also die. The plasma cells will die. The antibodies are also removed from the system. But these cells, which have become anti memory cells, they will re remain in the body for a long time. And by chance, if the same kind of anti antigen with this kind of square epitope comes up again in life, then these memory cells will once again replicate, and then the same process goes on. So you can see that there is a certain learning aspect by changing these shapes to suit the antigenic epitope. The, the, system, the B cell learns how to, how to catch hold of the antigenic epitope, and then it multiplies, it, it ensures that the security is not breached, and then finally it also remembers it. So there's a certain amount of learning, which is reinforcement learning, and then there's memory cells, which actually remember for future use so that future attacks are curtailed. This is one theory. There's another interesting theory by, propounded by uh, N.K. John in the year 1984. He, uh, he got the Nobel Prize for this theory called as the idiotypic network, idiotypic network theory. I'd rather go to the, uh, maybe I'll show you another. Yeah, this is what, uh, as, you, as you can see here, these Y-shaped things are basically the antibodies. So he's, in the previous case, we said that those antibodies are released and then they, they, they actually go and ensure that suppress the antigenic epitopes. So here he says that in addition to the paratopes, there are also something called as idiotopes. And then he says that all these and antibodies, they actually form a network. So this idiotope falls into the paratope of this. So this communicates with this one. The idiotope of this, which is a side bump here, it falls into the paratope of the next one. And they sort of keep on shaking hands. And by shaking hands, they communicate with each other. So then there is a network of such, network of such antibodies already in your body. So with this kind of a network already present in your body, whenever an antigen is detected by, let's say for instance, this particular antibody, like this particular epitope falls into the paratope, which seems to be exactly complementary, then this, this specific antibody is triggered. If, if it is triggered, what it does is that it increases its concentration, which means it, it actually regenerates itself into multiples because it, is, it has been able to find out the, detect an antigen. So it, is, it seems 
means it's more effective. So the concentration of this particular antibody will increase because it is able to detect the antigen. And then this one, because it's connected to this one, it will suppress this one saying that you, I don't need you no much about much of you. And this will ensure that this is also suppressed. So the concentration of the one which has actually detected will increase. By concentration, I mean the population of that particular antibody. Each of these antibodies are different because the paratopes are different. They are heterogeneous in nature because this antibody can detect only this type of uh, an epitope. This antibody, can this antibody can detect only a squarish epitope and so on. This one may be a triangular epitope. So they are all different, but this one by chance seem to have detected this particular antigen. So this, its concentration will increase. So its population will increase because it's more required. Whereas the populations of the others are comparatively diminished. So what is happening is that the one which has actually finding and detecting the antigen, that will suppress the others. And those will correspondingly suppress the others because they have never, never detected the antigen. The one which has detected the antigen correctly, that will grow in number. Those have, which have not detected will become smaller and smaller, smaller in number. So what's happening is that whatever those kind of, let's imagine in a social system, those laborers who are who are good and who can do a certain job will do multiply. Whereas those laborers who do not do good jobs, they are actually suppressed or their population dwindles. This is what's happening here. So there's a positive response and a negative response. So the winner, that is the one which is actually uh, detecting the antigen wins and it is, it is stimulated by the others. And this one on the contrary suppresses the other. So he mentions that there is a network of simulations and suppressions across several populations of antibodies. There are different populations of antibodies which are unique. Each population is unique is unique in their own way in the sense that the, the nature of the paratope is different as you can see here. And their respective subpopulations will increase or decrease based on the suppressions and stimulations received from the others. So this is what the theory suggests. From an equation point of view, you can see that the dynamics are something like this, that the rate of change with respect to time of the concentration of a particular type of lymphocyte, of a particular type of lymphocyte, meaning of a part which has a particular pattern on the paratope, is equal to its current concentration multiplied by the total excitatory, excitatory signals, which basically mean the stimulations it receives from the others, minus the total inhibitory signals. The inhibitory signals are basically the suppressions received from the others. So this one plus plus the rate at which these lymphocytes are produced. As we have already seen earlier also, we said that the cells die and new cells are generated. Here also, some of the lymphocytes die, but new lymphocytes are introduced too. So rate at which they are produced again, and minus the rate at which some of the lymphocytes die. Some of them will die, some of them will come up again. So this will be added and this will be subtracted. So the overall rate of change of concentration will be based on these these four parameters, namely the excitatory signals, the inhibitory signals, rate at which they are produced and rate at which they die. Or in other terms, you can say that the rate of population where concentration has now been replaced by population is equal to the network stimulation minus network suppression plus the influx of agents. That means new agents or new lymphocytes are coming in minus, minus the death of those which are unstimulated. Those of, which are of no use will also die. So those are the ones which are removed from the system. So if you go by this thing, you will find that those, those uh, antibodies, or let's say, let's call them soldiers who are trying to protect your body, the, the number of soldiers which are actually improving or which prove to be more be beneficial to the system or which are more efficient, their concentration or their population will increase, whereas those which are not effective will die down. This is what the whole immune network is all about. So, so much of biology, for instance, but how do we really come into the our kind of world? So how is, how is an idiotopic network formed within the plasmatic biological system? How can we actually evolve these concentrations? How do, how do these concentrations of the best ones increase in the biological world? Well, let, let me show you a, a, a quick animation of the whole thing. 
uh, which which we have published in a paper. You can check this paper out if required for more details. And we have called it what is called as a localized idiotopic network. So let me just show you what it means all about. So here's a, uh, a typical look at uh, antigens of different kinds. Here you can, uh, sorry, uh, antibodies of different kinds. You can see antibodies which are black in color, brown in color, green in color, all different types of antibodies, uh, possibly flowing in a liquid medium. They are all mobile. They're moving around in your body. Now, if an antigen attacks, their populations are all different because you know, all of them are mixed up here. As you can see, in an actual system also, it's mixed up. Then how can you imagine a network of these kind of things? Because they are all moving around. Some wise are somewhere else, some wise in one side, some, y, some type of wise, like for instance, the greens are uh, covering this area also spatially. They are also here and so on and so forth. So this thing is a sort of a, uh, a very schematic representation of how the the populations are the do remember that they are all spread out spatially in your body and then it may happen that the antigen attacks in a particular space when the antigen attacks in this particular place it encounters maybe three three of these for instance it encounters the brown one then the green one and possibly the black one so when these three are close to the antibody then they naturally are in pro close proximity of its epitopes and from there on comes the, the say, stimulation suppressions. So whichever wins here in this small localized area, they there's a, imagine for instance, if the y, the green Ys win, that means the, it is capable of detecting the antigen first, then its population will increase, whereas the populations of the brown one and the, and the black ones will decrease. Decrease meaning some, the local populations will increase or decrease not the overall population. But if the antigen is attacking at many places, it will always assume, that it will always be that if Y is the one which is, the green Y is the one which is the best, naturally its population will increase everywhere, wherever the antigen has attacked. And in the process over, overall across the body, you will definitely feel, definitely find that the green Ys, which are more effective, their population will grow, whereas the other populations will dwindle. So you can see that it's a decentralized system. There's nobody controlling it, but in a, in a complete fluidic medium, when antigens, when the same kind of antigen attack everywhere, and if the green wires are the best ones, then the green wires will survive, whereas the others will not survive. So that's exactly what possibly happens in your body too. Now that's the, all this is biological side, but how do we actually implement it in our kind of world? So let's uh, have a look at how we can implement it. So this is once again, the same thing explained all over. You can see that there's a different antibody populations. There's an antigen, and then there are three different types of, uh, three different types of uh, antibodies, which are colored, which are labeled as green, uh, which are colored green, yellow, and red. The antigen looks like a star in this particular case. Then imagine that the red one, red antigen is the one that is actually detecting the antigenic, antigenic epitope. So the red one will suppress the y, green Y and the yellow Y. And so the green, the others will stimulate it. That means the green ones which have failed in doing it and the yellow one which has also failed will, will stimulate the red one. So the red one will increase in population and so on. So this is exactly what I, what I mentioned. I'm just repeating it once again in case. So the, in, the red Y becomes the winner and it will slowly suppress the others. But do remember that it may happen that in another case, after this attack is over, another type of antigen comes up wherein the, y, the yellow Y may be the best one. Under such conditions, the yellow Y will, yellow Y's population will increase, whereas the red Y's population will decrease because it's not turning out to be effective in attacking this new antigen. So every time it's a dynamic sort of thing in the whole process, you might find that if heterogeneous antig antigens actually interact with your body, then corresponding populations will increase. Okay, so we did try an experiment on the on a real system, on a computational domain. We, I hope you all can hear me. I'm talking to the screen for a long time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. So here's a, here's a typical network of computers. 
wherein uh, wherein there are uh, antibodies moving around. Well, you might say, what is an antibody? The antibody in this case is some what is called as a mobile agent. A mobile agent is basically a program with a certain service in it. Like an antibody also has a service. Its service is possibly to kill the a particular type of antigen with a particular type of epitope. Here in this particular case, you can imagine a network. And in a network, if there is some issue in a particular area, then some particular antibody needs to get there and then solve that problem. So we, we define some things like node under attack, which is the which is which is an antigen. For instance, this particular computer is now under attack, which means there's a problem out there. It could be a problem of some other person hacking it or whatever, whatever. So it, it is an, an, an attack. And the, the solutions to the attacks, to the various attacks, are actually carried out by, carried by these kind of agents which are moving across the network. And those agents which are moving across the network, they are actually what are called as mobile agents. So mobile agents carry programs which can service such kind of attacks. So they are all moving. So there are different types of mobile agents moving across the network. They're continuously moving and patrolling the network so as to ensure that if there is any danger anywhere, then they'll try to go there and service it. But if the, if the attack comes up many times, or how do we now model the immune system here so that the attacks are quickly quelled because an attack could come up on one particular computer and it could quickly go to other computers too. And under such conditions, then naturally you need to ensure that the, the best ones, the, the antibodies with the, sorry, the mobile agents, which have the best programs to quell the particular attack, suddenly increase in population so that they can service everyone in a parallel manner. So this is the basic idea behind this. So let me uh, let me show you the animation, which possibly will explain what the whole thing is about. So here's the network. We start off from the beginning. We have a LAN, for instance. We used a LAN with several computers connected in different ways. These are virtual networks, overlay sort of networks on a LAN. Then, so this is the network of computers. We will call them as nodes in a, uh, of the network. Then there are different types of agents. So here we have selected four agents called type type one agent to type four agent, each of them has a solution to a problem. So a problem could occur anywhere in the system. They, these, these four agents have a certain solution to different solutions to the problem. We need to find out which is the best solution. So this is a sort of a learning mechanism wherein you try to protect your system by learning which one of these agents should uh, has the actual answer. So let's let's start the thing. So these are all agents. These agents keep moving around by carrying services. They are now actually metaphors of the antibodies. So they they keep they are all everywhere across the network. You can see different colors indicating different types of agents. So these agents uh, they keep on migrating it. They are actually patrolling the various nodes. They move from one node to the other. And then they keep on finding out if there is any attack. And if there is any attack, they try to service it. So let's imagine that there is an attack at a certain place. For instance, this particular computer. So if, when this particular computer has an attack, then what it does by itself is that it intimates its neighbors that it has been attacked. So this attack is done by some kind of a pheromone sort of thing, which is which are called as danger signals in immune system theory. Uh, there is a there is a thing called danger signals. So th this sort of emanates danger signals to its neighbors. So it sort of puts up danger signals, telling its neighbors that it is under attack. So please help me out. When this happens, the agents which are moving around and which are across its neighbors or any other places, they will all try to come over to that particular node under attack. So this is only a subset of agents that which have come to that. Remember that there could be other agents which have not reached here, unfortunately. Maybe there would be a better agent somewhere far away, but unfortunately it has not come here. That these things could happen because the whole system is plastic in nature. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can proceed, sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, well, how much time do I have? Sir, you have 20 minutes more, sir. 20 minutes, okay. Yes. 
So as you can see that the agents which are somewhere close by, yes, sir, they sir. will start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The root path are visible, sir. Okay. So these agents now can, which are in the neighborhood, they come up to this particular system, which is under the node under attack. So these are all solutions. As you can see, uh, two of the uh, the orange ones have come up, uh, six, uh, five of the yellow ones have come up, three of these green and one of this, uh, one of this white one. Now you can see from this that since more of yellow ones have come up, it generally means that these people have been more successful in nature. So in this particular computer, we'll try out the ones which have largest population because generally it's the largest population that is that, that is naturally been more effective. So it will take the yellow one and try it out. So it will take the yellow one and try to solve the problem. So it will take the program from one of the yellow ones and it will try to execute the program. And then of course it could happen that it could be a good solution, it could be a bad solution, anything could happen. If it's a bad solution, naturally it will decrease the, kill a few of those uh, yellow ones because they have not been effective and then increase the population of the others, namely the green, the white and the orange ones. But if it is, if the yellow ones were successful in actually quelling the attack or solving the problem there, then their population is increased. Let's imagine a case like, for instance, it really succeeded in doing it. Then what happens is that it will increase the population of the, increase the population of the yellow ones and it will decrease the population of the others. So here it's, it's increasing the population, it's decreasing the population, the orange ones, killing one of them, killing one green one, and then finally killing the only white one. So this is what we call as an idiotypic network, which is localized in nature. It's not across the whole global picture. In a small area, some, something has happened, somebody has won, so that person's subpopulation has increased, whereas the other subpopulations have been correspondingly decreased based on the effectiveness of the, of the, or the performance of the one of the winner. So what happens is that since it has been good here, I mean, yellow ones have done well here, their population has increased, whereas the other populations have been decreased. Don't forget that these green ones also exist elsewhere. Yeah, brown ones also, the orange ones also exist anyways, otherwise. But if there are many such attacks, then at many places, if the yellow ones are winning, then the yellow, one, the yellow population will naturally explode, whereas the other populations will go down effectively ensuring that the system is protected from that particular attack across the network. So this is what we called as an idiotypic network. We actually carried out the, we, we did not simulate this. We actually had a, a local area network. We configured the whole system in this fashion. And then we actually had agents moving around and then we did the complete exercise and emulated it. So then after that, once the attack is done, then things go on normally. The, the agents start moving once again across the network, patrolling it for any further attacks. Okay, so these are some of the interesting uh, uh, results which we got. Possibly, I don't think I have the time to explain it, but those of you who are interested can uh, uh, can come to our site and download the paper and go through that. So we had some very good and very uh, different sort of results which uh, we never thought of initially, but the, those were quite interesting to understand. Let's let us go further. And the point to be noted is that I've been blabbing around so much, but how do we actually make a system like this? And how do you do it in times of COVID when you're sort of trapped in your own home and you can't really do much? So I have a solution, but uh, uh, I'm just looking at the time, how much time I have. Okay. So one important thing I'm not going to look at this is what we call as a cyber physical system. So most of you, you naturally are talking, we are talking of cybersecurity. Most of you know what is a cyber physical system, but how do you put the intelligence in it? Then, well, this is how we put the intelligence in it. I just showed you a cyber physical system where the mobile agents form the cyber part, the physical part is the computers and together the, the two things, the mobile agents and the physical system to the, together contribute to the intelligence of the system in the process. All the problems are solved as you can see, as, you, as we have just seen, in, and also the system is protected. So here's a, a, a framework for a cyber physical system. I'm not going to details of that. Most of you possibly know by, by now. 
But let's look at nature's cyber physical system versus our kind of cyber physical system. A quick look at it, like nature also has a cyber physical system. So I call a typical cell as a micro cyber physical system because a cell also has a, some of the cells have a nucleus, which is the basic processor. Some of them, which are eukaryotes, do not have eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Some one, one type having a cell inside, a nucleus inside, when others don't have a cell a nucleus inside. But then they are capable of physical activity. They are capable of physical activity. They are capable of soft activity just like we have cyber physical. Here also there's soft activity, which is processing inside and also physical activity, which is possibly movement, trying to get nutrients from the outside of the cell and then eating it up and then understanding what it is, breaking up into smaller pieces and then, then trying to ensure that the system is, the cell by itself lives. So this is the micro, micro cyber physical system in, the, in nature. But now, if you consider a collection of cells, to a certain extent, then you can imagine an ant. An ant is a collection of cells, of such cells. So if you consider an ant as a collection of cells and then you collect several ants, then it becomes a macro CPS, wherein, wherein there are many ants forming a colony. And each of those ants by themselves is, comprises a micro CPS, a large number of micro CPS. So an ant is a collection of a large number of micro CPS within one macro CPS. And then there are several such micros, macro CPSs, that is many ants which form the colony. The same thing could be looked upon as a shoal of fish or a flock of birds or whatever. Coming to a mega thing, you can imagine that a human being, for instance, or a gorilla or maybe a, an elephant could be looked upon as a mega CPS because it has capability of thinking, it has capability of acting into its environment, so all those things are embedded there too. So there is a cyber component in it. There's a thinking component in it, soft component, and there's also a natural physical component. So this is the, this is the from, from a natural perspective, nature's perspective, these could be, could be taught, looked upon as cyber physical systems, nature's cyber physical systems. But how do we actually go about making our own? Now let's, let me again, once again, tell you how it looks like, how, a, what I just mentioned looks like. So from cells, if you imagine a unicellular being like for instance, a bacteria or a human cell, you, you can imagine a collection of cells. So there's a lot, large collection of cells. The large collection of cells are then finally connected to, to each other. So when they're connected, then it becomes a small entity, like for instance, a human being or whatever. So, so initially in this particular case, we started off with cells, we put up cells together and then we connected them together to form a network of cells. And then finally, finally you make a complete envelope across it so that it is contained within a body. And these are all connected cells. So each cell by itself is a processor now. Each cell is a processor. They are all connected as a network. And then what's missing? There's only one thing that's missing. The one thing missing here, they, they are communicating. So there's a cyber element in it. There are processors in some sense that's physical, but there's no physical activity. So the physical activity is also important. So the physical activity comes when, when, the, when it actually moves, the actual system moves. Let us look at the, uh, the other side. So, so here you can see that it has actually moved. So when it has moved, this movement actually happens to be the, the physical activity. So there is cyber component, there's a physical component, there's a movement component too. Together they make the, the cyber physical system, the biological side. Now, how does the other side come up? Like from our side, physical uh, computational world, from the computational perspective. So here's how we start off. We, we imagine that robots are the actuating organs or maybe processors with actuating mechanisms with mobile agents also embedded in them. So we start off with a mobile agent. I represent the mobile agent like this with a capital M in a sphere, which is basically a program, which is written and embedded into a embedded processor or laptop or computer or possibly a robot itself, or maybe even an IoT device. So here's the robot or the processing device, processing and sensing device, sensing, actuating, processing, all done together. Then we, we start off like what we did. We, the mobile agent is a cell, so we have a collection of cells. 
So from collection of cells, we connect them together. So all the all the mobile agents, though they are softwares, software components, they do talk to each other by some means. They share information. So they are in some sense connected. These are not physical connections. They are cyber connections. Then these things have to be now embedded into a network of processors or robots or sensing devices, sensing and actuating devices. So now this second component has to be supported has to be superimposed in the network of such kind of processors or robots. So how do we do that? So we put up mobile agents in various various robots here. So this mobile agent is a program within the robot. This is another program and so on and so forth. So all these mobile agents basically carry a set of programs which they are capable of. If a particular robot requires that I need a particular program which it doesn't have, then naturally that particular mobile agent moves to that program and executes it there. So it, there's a mobility of the program as such, as you can see, as we have seen earlier too, that it moves from one robot or one processor to the other and then executes it. Here also it moves from one place to the other. I hope the animations are clear. Yes, sir, very clear, sir. Okay. Likewise, so there are so many mobile agents. So these are basically the antibodies. The antibody, the mobile agents can clone also. When they clone, naturally they replicate itself just like the population of the antibodies explode. So here also you can model the explosion of mobile agents which are good in nature. That means those which are actually having good programs, those which are having less, uh, I mean, those which are having programs which do not have a proper performance, they could die. So some of them could die, for instance, as you can see right now. Whereas some new ones also have to be added, just like the equation we said that some new lymphocytes also come up. So new antibodies also come up. So new antibodies can also come up. So that is by creation of new, new mobile agents. So you can clone mobile agents, you can move the mobile agent, you can kill the mobile agent, all these things are possible. And then these agents actually carry good programs, different types of programs, and then they move around and those programs which are good, they will survive because their populations will survive. So you can model an exact cyber physical system with the kind of intelligence involved in it, the kind of learning mechanisms involved in it, and also the security involved, which is required. So this is what, what I would prefer to put up as a cyber physical system with mobile agents moving around across a network, which each of the nodes in the network, they're able to sense, they're also able to capture information, they are also able to physically move objects. So the last, we're coming to the last part, uh, how do we make such kind of things? It's all right to tell, tell you all across and just uh, keep telling you more and more and not being able to use it at all. So how do we tailor such kind of population-based algorithms? So remember that here the population is a population of agents, then you're trying to find out which of the population should be more because you need a better performance across the cyber physical system. So you need the better programs to survive and the lesser programs to be filtered out. So in order, so in order to design what, what we call as intelligent cyber physical systems. So the challenge is that the cyber physical system has a physical component and the physical component would mean sensors and motors which are exposed to real environments. So you, from real environments, you take some sensory things and then drive the motors. So how, then how do we put up nature's algorithms into such things? Then it has to be central. Should it be centralized or decentralized? It may be part, partly centralized, partly decentralized. Then how do we go about programming them? So for this, uh, I'm... Uh, I cannot explain this whole thing, but please take a screenshot of this for those who are interested in actually programming such systems. If you take a screenshot, you will the uh, the links are already there. If you want to see how you can program it, we have a we have developed a, a multi mobile agent uh, system or a platform which is open source in nature, named Tartarus, which can actually write which by which you can actually create mobile agents of the type which we have mentioned right now. You can program those mobile agents. You can program it in such a manner that they will move autonomously in a network. You can put these kind of, this particular uh, mobile agent platform on your laptop, on your, uh, on your PC, or using Windows or, or Linux or Raspberry, or if you have a Raspberry Pi, which is nowadays very cheap, available at around 2000, or 4,000 rupees. 
you can put that thing, you can connect sensors to your Raspberry Pi, you can connect motors and actuators to your Raspberry Pi, and then you can make these mobile agents jump from one Raspberry Pi to another and actuate, click photographs, try to find out what is the temperature there, what is the pressure at some place, and then activate a motor to rotate forward or backward. You can put them, you can make a, um, make a robot using Raspberry Pi and control it, or you can possibly not use any of these at all and just use the whole system on a single laptop. On a single laptop itself, you can make, make different platforms. You can have multiple platforms. Each platform would represent a node. So you can actually emulate the, so since you are sitting at home right now, possibly, you can use Use your own laptop to actually make a network which emulates the LAN in your lab. And you can actually make the agent move from one platform in your laptop to another platform in your laptop. You could have hundreds of platforms like that in your laptop and test your programs, test the movement of the agents, the, what the agent should do in one particular platform, what it should do and where it should, should migrate, the routing protocols, the, the what exact behavior it should show at various, various such kind of platforms which are actually nodes in a network. You can connect those nodes or platforms together in a particular topology. All these things you can do in your single laptop. Once you feel that everything is fine and you feel that the programs which you have written are okay, then you can move out, move into an actual lab and then deploy it on a typical LAN. And it will work just the same way. So those of you who are interested, please go through it. Before you go through maybe the YouTube link which has been shown here, could be one way out to quickly explain what Tartarus is all about and then how it can help you in actually realizing such kind of intelligent cyber physical systems. So if once you have a cyber physical systems, those of you who are interested in security can also again bring out about better security on such systems. And do remember you can actually implement a decentralized system. You can implement a centralized system. You can also implement a decentralized system in this. So it has a large number of features. And it also provides other libraries, like for instance, those of you who have uh, robots, how to, how to possibly interface with robots, all those things are also there. So do go through this so that uh, you really get a feel of how you can control, you can make a cyber physical system and actually deploy it later when you actually go to a, a lab. Uh, well, I don't think we have time for videos, but. Uh, I think I can take some questions if at all. So uh, wrapping it all up, but don't forget that uh, in the process, don't forget to explore nature and its physical systems from an engineering perspective. If you are a teacher, then try to bring about more awareness in awareness about nature. Since we are all teaching engineering in some form or the other, don't forget to bring in the nature natural component in it. The, component of telling students to also look at nature before they solve a problem. So much for today and so much for the lecture. I hope you all have enjoyed it. I can take a few questions if there's time. Yes, sir, there are a few questions. Sure. Uh, the first question is, can you please name some software which will create this type of network? I mean, uh, that you are explaining about the emulation of artificial immune system. I think they're asking about that, sir. Yeah, so that is exactly what I mentioned here. That, that This is the software. Yes, yes, sir. So you all can go through that. You can download it. It's open source. You can also add to it and then program it accordingly. One more question, sir. Yes. Uh, that is a mobile agents are software and they're asking how it moves. How it moves? Yes. Well, that is again explained within this. Uh, when you when you look into Tartarus, you will find how it moves. The point to be noted is that the agent by itself is a program. The Tartarus the Tartarus platform controls the agent and ensures that it moves from one node to the other. So you need to write a program. You don't have to write too much of programs. They are actually basically commands which can make a, an agent move from one to the other, and that too in an autonomous manner. You don't have to keep on moving uh, moving from one node to the other or one computer to the other to push that program to the other side. If you already, you can write a very small program, which is already explained in the manuals, 
how to write programs that actually make the agents move from one node to the other. Of course, if you need more technical information, do feel free to get back to me and we can explain the whole thing to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you very much, sir, for opening our eyes towards the engineering aspect of nature and uh, the inspiration from ants, bees, fish, etc. And also you have explained uh, the paradigm of natures like artificial immune system, evolutionary systems, swarm intelligence, self-healing, artificial neural networks. And very clearly in detail, you have explained about uh, the artificial immune system Sir, on behalf of the organizers and the participants, I extend our sincere gratitude for sparing your valuable time for enlightening us about the topic, Nature Inspired Learning Mechanism. So now I hand over the session to our HOD, Dr. S. Geeta. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Most welcome, sir. Sir, uh, thank you so much. Already Victor Mama have concluded about uh, the topics which we, you have covered on today's session. Uh, and one word which I have to say is we are blessed to listen. You are such a senior professor's uh, talk on today. Uh, that's what I just I wanted to record it on today. Thank you so much for accepting our request and uh, uh, delivered your uh, lectures and the sense of sharing your uh, views with us on today. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity too. And Thank it's you, all sir. been my pleasure. Okay. It's our Thank pleasure you. too, sir.